Hi, my name is Ray Jean. I used to be a Jehovah's Witness and I've been wanting to make this video for some time and I just didn't know how to formulate the words. So I'm trying my best to just get this in and explain my story about why I chose to leave the Jehovah's Witness uh, witnesses and why I feel as though they're just a harmful high control group honestly you know my story is interesting I wasn't born or raised a Jehovah's Witness I was dating a guy who was three years older than me I was 16 he was 19 and he grew up a Jehovah's Witness his mom was disfellowshipped for some time but of course around the time that we got together she started going back to the hall, which meant he was going back to the hall. And he started to take the witnesses very seriously, but he still was in a relationship with me. So we dated for about two years. Um, and in that time period, I was going through a transition where I had an unsteady home life and things were just crazy on my end. So. I started going to the Kingdom Hall in an effort to make my relationship work because it was becoming a problem that I was Baptist and he was a Jehovah's Witness. So he encouraged me to come. I came to the Kingdom Hall and I liked the rules. I liked the setup and everything because in my home life, I didn't have that. It was, like I said, it was very unstable. So the witnesses having these strict rules was very appealing at the time for a 16 year old me. Also, you know, I was love bombed. The first moment I stepped to a kingdom hall, I don't remember what we just talked about, but I do remember that everybody in the room came up and talked to me. And that meant a lot because, like I said, my home life, I was very much alone and I just needed that association and it was nice, you know, it was nice. So I was like, there's got to be something to this, you know. So despite my family not supporting my decision, after months of studying with the witnesses, I went to my boyfriend's baptism in about I think 2012 2012 and I went to his baptism to support him and that's my first convention that I ever went to and I was always a bible reader so being told what this scripture means and what this means what this it was very appealing in the sense of like oh I never understood that I never got that so it was nice to have it and it seems so real. When I started having my own Bible studies, I was still very much into it. There were some things that were hard to understand, like the 1914 teaching, but I think that's everybody has a hard time with that. And uh, when they start talking about like the disfellowshipping and things like that, and disfellowshipping wasn't really brought up, but it was brought up later. Anyway. I liked my studies because, again, I felt like I, did, I, as a Baptist, I never understood my Bible. So I wanted to understand it. So they were presenting the information to me like I was learning what my Bible was saying. But, you know, what it actually is, is indoctrination. They take the first few chapters of the book that you go through to kind of get on your good side they talk about like what is the what is the bible who is jesus who is god what's the paradise things like that that's very like appealing and easy to digest as you get to the later chapters it gets more harder to digest but you feel like well they haven't lied to me in the previous chapters so there's no way that they're lying to me now. And that was the honest belief. So I rolled with it. Again, I also wanted to make sure that my relationship worked. So I needed this to make sense. And it did for a period of time, even though I didn't 
agree fully or understand fully everything, I still went with it um, and was really excited because me and my boyfriend were going to be on the same page. That relationship didn't work out, but I ended up staying in the religion for 10 years. We broke up within the first year of me going to the kingdom hall, <laughs> you know? So for nine years, I made Jehovah's Witnesses my entire life. I was, you know, didn't talk to my family like that because they were worldly. You know, I made the brothers and sisters in my congregation, my new mom, my new dad, my new sister, like they tell you. I did everything correct, you know? I got baptized. I started pioneering. I was a need grader. I went to my local ASL congregation. I was very, very zealous because you could not tell me that this wasn't the truth. In my mind at the time, I knew that was the truth. There were a few things that happened along my journey that kind of woke me up. The first thing was when I got reproved for the first time. My first reproof was very traumatizing in the sense of, although they were nice to me, I'm not going to sit here and make them out to be monsters because that's not true. They weren't monsters. They were actually very kind. But the whole three brothers all kind of looking at me and asking me these really intimate questions, like they weren't just saying like, what did you do? It was more like, how many times did you do this? It was very intimate details that was uncomfortable and a little, it was weird. Um, was very uncomfortable the entire time, but I felt like I needed to do that in order to get on Jehovah's good graces. But that was privy number one. Privy number two was after many years of being in an organization and doing so much research, I still didn't understand 1914. It, it, it it's 1914 is such a challenging belief, you know, and I'm not going to go into my results that I found, but I will say something that is true should not be that difficult to explain. Um, and it should not, you shouldn't have to do loops and jump through hurdles in order to get somebody to understand it. You know what I mean? Um, yeah, it just didn't make sense. The third thing that kind of woke me up, but I pushed it down was when we studied the watchtower that was talking about how the governing body is infallible and they're not inspired by God. I was always under the impression since I started studying was always under the impression that the governing body were inspired by God. And that's why they were saying what they were saying, doing what they were doing because they had God's backing. If you're not inspired by God, that makes you no different than you. Like it makes, we're the same. We're the same basically. And I'm like, if that's the case, that's like me saying I have the truth and you should all follow me and listen to what I say what what backing do you have? Because it's apparently it's not God's backing. So it's like, it's just men making up rules and people are just following. But again, I took it as me just not fully understanding it. And I was trusting the governing body as I've been programmed and trained to do. So I proceeded on. Then it got personal. When I got reproved a second time, um... And again, with my reproofs, I knew I was wrong and I immediately went to the elders because I felt guilty. So I go to the elders for the second time. They make me leave my ASL hall and I go to an English congregation nearby my house. And I remember at that time, my best friend, she stopped talking to me. Now, this wasn't just a person that I talked to occasionally. This was someone that I talked to almost every day. 
She was my best friend. We did everything together. She stopped talking to me. Mind you, at this time, I'm down. I, I feel guilty. I feel horrible. My life is in shambles. Everything was just going wrong at that period of time. And I really needed my friend there. And she turned her back on me. Months go by. I asked her, why did you do that? Why did you turn your back on me? I really needed you. And she said, well, I had to because you're bad association. Sorry. So I was like, how am I bad association? Like, how am I bad association? So she's like, well, you know, you know, you got reproved for a second time. It seems like there's things going on with you and et cetera, et cetera. And I said, so that is justification for you not being there for me? When I went to the elders about this, because she doesn't know this part, but I went to the elders about this and I was crying and pouring my heart out about my friend betraying me. And they basically were just like, well, that's not how, that's not the witness thing to do. That's not how Jehovah feels about you. You know, sometimes some people are just not good friends. So I chalked her, her, I chalked her up to just not being a good friend, but that always stuck with me because my response to her was if I was bad association, Jehovah would have removed me from the congregation, but he didn't. So how am I bad association? That taught me that witnesses make up their own rules. Each individual witness make up their own rules. I've started to learn that even though the governing body says you need to shun your son if he's no longer a Jehovah's Witness, some people will say, well, they say that, but I'm not shunning my son. Witnesses will pick and choose which things they will follow. And I didn't like that because I thought that we were all, one thing that sold me was that Jehovah's Witnesses were a unit and everybody believed the same thing. Everybody went the same way about things. Yeah, there were certain things that were like principles that you could, you know, like, eh. But for the most part, when it came to sound fundamental things like a person who's reproved versus someone who's disfellowship, it was clear rules. It's in the Organized to Do God's Will book. It's clear rules about how to treat those individuals. And she chose to treat me her way because that's just what she felt like she needed to do. And ever since then, I said, I will trust people a little bit less. And I didn't hold it against the organization. I held it up against her, but it always stayed in my mind. Then we went to the generations teaching. The generations teaching was talking about the belief before that, before that generation passed away, that the end would be here. But then the end didn't come when that generation died out. So, they changed the definition of a generation to make it the generation over the generation. So you see how it kind of like overlaps. So the, the second generation that also belongs to the other generation makes it so that the generation continues. And I just felt like that was an excuse for them saying, yeah, like our prophecy our prediction did not come true so we just have to explain it away they say it's new light but new light is just we said this previously it didn't come true so now we have this understanding but it's basically just to cover their ass i never believed the generation's teaching and i i looked at it in asl and in english and it neither of it made sense to me i came to the same conclusion that they were just trying to cover their ass um, and when I started to really sit there and think about it, I was like, what else are they covering? But I didn't have the guts to do more research to figure that out. So I kind of just let it pass and I moved on. But then I became tired. COVID happened at 2020. Um... We were at home, all meetings were on Zoom, all service was on Zoom. So I thought, oh, I'm home to do my meetings and everything. I should have tons of energy, but I didn't. 
I was constantly tired. I was constantly stressed. I just wasn't happy. I remember one time I was crying to a friend and I was telling her how much I just hated my life. I was alone. I had nobody. You know, I had some shit that wasn't making I'm sorry. I had some things that wasn't making sense. You know, it was a overload of, you know, study your watchtower, study your midweek, study for your studies, study for service. Then I had my actual job. Then I had, you know, and it was just, it was just, the, it was an overwhelming amount of work that I just was constantly drained and tired. And we joked about it during service, but I really felt that. So I noticed that I started cutting my camera off more to kind of give myself some peace. And I started to learn that I was more at peace when I wasn't at the kingdom hall. Or like I was, I was more at peace when my camera was off and I wasn't really listening. You know, I, I just could take some time for myself because when you're a witness, you don't have any downtime. You know, Monday was meeting, Tuesday was a uh, service, Wednesday was like, I, I would go to family worships or do personal study. Thursday was studying for Saturday. Friday was studying for Saturday. Saturday was the meeting. Also Bible studies. Sunday was service, more Bible studies. I worked 40 plus hours a week. I had no rest and I honestly was just very overwhelmed and exhausted to the point that I started to give my studies away. I started to try to lessen the load as much as I could before I eventually just took everything off. And I said, I'm just, I'm just tired. I'm tired of this stress. I'm tired of this work. I'm tired of pretending that I'm happy when I wasn't. I'm just tired. I just don't, I'm tired. So I started keeping my camera off. I stopped, I started missing meetings. I started missing service and I ain't going, I'm not going to hold you guys. I was happier. I was so much happier. I was at peace. I was finally able to sleep in on Saturdays after working 50 hours a week. Shoot, even working 40 hours a week, I was able to sleep in. It was nice to get that break. I felt guilty for doing that, but I started to choose me at that time and I knew I needed to take a break. But then that break became something else. All those questions that I had over the years, all the things that kind of piled up, that I kind of, I kept pushing down. And I realized now that's just cognitive dissonance. I kept just, oh no, no, you know, I'm just, I need to do more research. Oh, no, no, no. It's not like that. Like, I just, you know, it was always something that I needed to do. More pressure for me to do something. But simply, it just doesn't make sense. And I wasn't happy because I was living a life that made me unhappy. You know, I was just unhappy. <laughs> it wasn't a good situation, especially for me. So I'm on TikTok. It's like, 11 p.m. I'm on TikTok. I'm scrolling and I come across the hashtag X, XJW. And she talked about the generations teaching. And the way she caught my attention and the wording that she used was the exact wording that I said in my brain when I was going through the generations teaching. And she made some points and brought out some things that I, that made sense. I couldn't refute it. It, it. it made sense. And again, I already had thought this. I click on her page and I see she has other videos talking about Jehovah's Witnesses. And I went down a rabbit hole of not just her page, but other pages. I went down the, I, I went down a rabbit hole. I was scrolling on TikTok up until 6 a.m. looking at everything, just scrolling. And I was overwhelmed with the amount of information that I was consuming. But what, what really scared me is that it all made sense. And it answered a lot of questions that I kind of pushed down because 
I was scared of the answer. I was scared. And also, I dedicated 10 years of my life to this organization. I did not want to jeopardize that by consuming this information, but it was unrefutable. I cried so much that 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 day. And I cried so much for months after. I didn't say nothing to anybody. I didn't say nothing to my friends. Uh, I simply just kept it to myself. And I slowly started to isolate myself from my friends. Not because I was trying to be sneaky and I was doing things that I shouldn't be doing. At this time, I wasn't really doing anything besides looking at apostate information, I guess. But I wasn't doing anything as far as like my actions. I wasn't sinning against God. Um, I simply just was too mentally tired to lie to them because I show my emotion and I didn't want them to look at me and be like, something's going on with you. And then I have to either try to lie or I have to explain myself. And I didn't feel like it. So I just kind of kept my distance. But I still talked to them. I still hung out from time to time. It just wasn't all the time like it used to be. And then it got weird. So I told myself, I don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness anymore. And that's what I said to myself. I didn't say anything to anybody. And I tried to keep it to myself longer. I came up with a plan to leave my ASL congregation to move to an English congregation that didn't really know me. So that way I could kind of fall under the radar and disappear. Because I knew that I wasn't going to be able to live my life the way I want to without losing all my friends in the process. Thankfully, I was a convert. So I still had my family that I could rely on. But it didn't lessen the pain. Uh, I knew I wasn't going to be able to keep them. And that broke my heart too. And I think that's also why I avoided them to kind of lessen the blow. Um, so I came up with this plan. Everything was set in motion. And I messed up because I started dating my now fiance. You know, I started dating him. And a month or two into our relationship, I was still kind of like leaving. Like I was doing like the final touches of me leaving. And we did a YouTube, uh, we were streaming. We, we are, we're both gamers. If you look on my page, there's, you know, me streaming because I was a streamer. And we, me and him were playing a, a game. And throughout the video, he's calling me babe. I... Didn't think anybody from my congregation or anybody that was a witness was going to be watching my page uh, because I've streamed many times with him and nobody ever said anything. But a, but this particular day, a friend did watch my video, a JW friend, and he sent the video into a group chat of other people, other friends that I had put them all in a group chat and sent it to them so that everybody could watch the video. And they see that he's calling me babe and they know that I have a secret worldly boyfriend. That was hard. <laughs> I called him and I was like, why didn't you just tell me like directly to me? And he tried to deflect and say, oh, you know, he wanted to make sure that it was real or whatever. But I said, at the end of the day, you saw the video. You could have just came to me. But anyway, um, you know, I told him that I don't plan on being a Jehovah's Witness. And that was the first time I said it out loud. Then I told another friend who he found out and he actually called me and was like, you know, I kind of could tell that you weren't really feeling the witnesses. And we talked about that. And then I told another friend. 
word spread quickly that I no longer was a Jehovah's Witness or that I was questioning being a Jehovah's Witness, I guess. I had a friend, she hit me up and she was like, hey, can I come over to your house? I want to give you a gift. But I knew deep down she wanted to ask me about the video and what's going on with me. And I didn't have a problem doing that one-on-one, -on -one, um, but it was really nerve wracking. She ended up coming to my house with two other friends. She didn't tell me that they were coming. They just all showed up. Um, I wasn't prepared for that. And I basically was like bombarded with questions, explanations, what's going on. Everything that I said, there was a rebuttal, everything that I tried to show. And I didn't want to talk about the things that I found because I was trying to be respectful of their beliefs. They don't want to be exposed to apostate information. So I didn't want to share that with them. So it was hard to explain myself when... I didn't want to contaminate their minds in a sense. Um, I tried my best, but I just, anyway, when the conversation ends, everybody goes home and I was so relieved. They told me by the end of the conversation, can you let us know if you decide to no longer be a Jehovah's Witness? And I say, yeah, sure, I can do that because they wanted me to take control over the narrative. I said, sure, yes, I can do that. A week or two goes by and I did more research as I told them that I would. And I told them in a really long, lengthy message that I don't want to be a Jehovah's Witness and why. And that I love them and that I hope that despite me not being a Jehovah's Witness that we can still be friends. And... I was emphasizing that because I was trying to see if I could leave the organization with my friends intact. I was shocked to find out that I sent about eight messages, maybe nine messages. Only three of them got back to me. The remaining six didn't say anything. I pressed for a week or two. I pressed like, hey, did you see my message? Did you get it? Because da, 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 da. whenever I had a friend who was disfellowshipped or who was getting disfellowshipped or who was leaving, I always said my piece, said goodbye, told them that I love them, et cetera, et cetera. But they just were quiet. One of them said, I need more time. The other one said, I don't know what to say. And the third one, she wrote a long novel about things that we already hashed out in the past that wasn't related to the conversation at all. So I don't know why she did that. Um, I didn't even read the whole thing because I started to realize she was blaming me for everything. And I already knew what type of time she was heading. So I just didn't finish the, the message. But um, I said, okay, and left it at that. I didn't have anything to say to, to any of the six that didn't respond. But I did appreciate the three who did. Um, during this process, while I was waiting for my friends to respond to me, while I was still sending out the messages, I didn't have Twitter. The biggest thing about if you know me personally and you live in my area, everybody was talking about Regine has a Twitter account where she's using the XJW hashtag. And everybody uses that as the reason why nobody talks to me. And that kind of just spread but it's it's not true before i reactivated my twitter this was already going on i was already doing research there was no twitter i sent out the messages to my friends there was no twitter i was waiting for responses from the six who didn't respond there was still no twitter 
And when I sent out a follow-up message to the six who didn't respond, and I only got like two messages back or three messages back, but they were, two of them said they don't know what to say. And then the other one would blame me for shit. Um, I just dropped it. I said, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I, I dropped it. A week or two goes by and I'm incredibly lonely because at this point, nobody's reaching out to me. Nobody's talking to me. Nobody's saying a thing. And I'm not going to keep reaching out to people who can't even respond to a heartfelt message because that really hurt my feelings. I was trying to be open and honest with them and they kind of just was like, okay, whatever. Like I was nothing, which really taught me that they really didn't care about me in the same way that I cared about them. And that hurt a lot. Um... I remember one time I was driving and I pulled off on the side of the road to cry. I cried for about maybe like 30 minutes. I cried. And not just like a boo-hoo cry. Like I'm like heaving, like crying. And I just knew that I was losing everything. I knew that I had wasted 10 years of my life for people who can't even have the courtesy of responding back to me. Who told me that we're family but was so quick to just dismiss and blame me and make it seem like things were my fault when I did exactly what they asked me to do. And then it was at that point that I said, I need a community. I need to get this out of me. I had all of these feelings, all of these thoughts, all, and I couldn't, I couldn't put it anywhere. My boyfriend, you know, I could talk to him, but he wouldn't understand because he's he's never been a Jehovah's Witness. So I started going on Twitter at that time, after I was already being shunned by my friends. I made a Twitter and I used that to talk to the XJW community for the first time. And from there, I was able to see other information that I was... At that time, I reposted a couple things. I think I responded to a couple things. And I didn't think that anybody was going to see my Twitter, mainly because I didn't broadcast my Twitter. People just found it, <laughs> to be honest. People just found it. And then it became, oh, I can't be friends with Ray because she's talking bad about witnesses on Twitter not realizing I made the Twitter when I was already being shunned. If you look at my Twitter and you scroll all the way down, you realize I really wasn't talking about the organization at that time. I was talking about my friends and how they're just shitty friends. That's really what I was talking about. As time went on, especially after they, you know, I started hearing from some other friends who are still in the organization, but they aren't in the organization. They were telling me the things that was being said and by who. And that's when I kind of lost it, to be honest. I kind of lost it. And I realized I need to do deeper research about what this religion is. What is this religion? How did it come about? Who came up with 1914? And when I started doing that, I'm not going to lie to you. I started posting those things that I found on Twitter out of spite. All of the information I shared is true. All of it. 1914 was not created by Jehovah's Witnesses. They took that teaching from someone else. Jehovah's Witnesses are the only people who believe that the fall of Babylon in Jerusalem took place in 607 BCE, even though scholars, archeologists, and the like have all confirmed that it took place in like 589 BCE or 595, 592. It didn't take place in 607. So then it's just, it's just a lot of information. And I started to share those things and all of a sudden, Regine is an apostate. And that's why I stopped talking to her because she's an apostate. Y'all already stopped talking to me before I was an apostate. 
I tried my best. I feel like had they just been up front with me and treated me like, I don't know, like a human being, treated me like a friend, uh, I wouldn't have made that Twitter. I wouldn't have made those posts. I wouldn't have said what I said. But I had to get those emotions out somewhere. And since I couldn't do it with them, I found another place to do it. And they just don't like it. But that's what it is. I don't regret it. I'm glad that it happened now. Because, first of all, it really pushed me to go deeper into this information to confirm all of my suspicions that I knew to not be true. It helped me meet uh, some amazing people. And it gave me a clean break. Because I see a lot of my PMO friends, the ones who are still physically in the organization, but they don't believe it. A lot of them have to hide and sneak and pretend like they still believe it. But I have the freedom to say, I don't believe it. I don't think it's true. And I get to live my life the way I want to. If you follow me, because I unfollowed everybody on Instagram and uh, most of my pages. Um, I said, if you choose to follow me, you're following me knowing what you know, which means we're here. Okay. It was a hard, hard, hard first year, but I wanted to make this video to show that even despite that, there is definitely a light at the end of the tunnel. I know if you're just now questioning or if you're just now leaving Jehovah's Witnesses, I know it feels like your world is shattering. You are alone. You don't have anyone. Like, did you know, like, over 80% of former Jehovah's Witnesses, when they leave, develop some type of mental illness, like depression and anxiety because of the shunning policy by Jehovah's Witnesses? And do you know that over 50% have contempt have considered uh unaliving themselves because their family and friends won't talk to them that's tragic it's tragic what this organization does to people i don't post on youtube because that's just not my thing i post on tiktok if you want to see my tiktok my tiktok is uh deconstruct with ray i'll add the link the link in the description. I'm very active on there, but I wanted to tell my story in a safe place um, and add my voice to this loving, beautiful community of former Jehovah's Witnesses, former fundies, former Mormons, former evang evangelicals. I can never say that right. Former two by twos, former cytologists, former high control group because we all have the same story and we all made it out i'm really proud of us for that but i wanted to share my story about how i learned about the witnesses and why i chose to leave and i really hope that this finds people in my area who heard otherwise because i know what's being said around and like my friend said, I want to clear the air and tell my truth and take control over the narrative. Everything that has been said about me is incorrect in regards to the timelines and of how everything came about, you know. And if you're upset with me because I openly speak about Jehovah's Witnesses and their lies... I'm sorry. That's all I can say. At the end of the day, I just wanted support from my friends, even if they didn't agree with my choice. And I would have kept everything to myself. But because my heart was shattered, because they took 10 years of my life and lied to me, and... I'm made out to be some type of villain before I even did anything. I might as well go ahead and roll with it. So now I'm a villain for real. <laughs> I'm a villain for real now. But anyway, so that's my story. That's 
why I became a Jehovah's Witness. I look forward to hearing your stories. I am actively on YouTube reading everybody else's stories about why they left the Jehovah's Witnesses. Check me out on TikTok. I'm very active on there. I usually read and respond to messages. And yeah, thanks for listening.